Okay, I'm going to let Ed get started because I want to really want to keep this as close on time as possible. Give us a, two more minutes. And then he's going to put, put him up here. While we're waiting, I'll launch the poll. So we'll start on that. Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Please fill out this uh, survey poll to find out how did you hear about the event and where you are right now and et cetera, et cetera. We're looking good here, everybody. It's so good to see everybody. My gosh. So glad you all got here. This is going to be an exciting weekend. Hi, Barney. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Harold. Dina. Hi. How are Shadow, you? Pastor Danita. Bishop. Oh, all my, all my big guns are here. Weathersby. Hi, Beatrice. Hi. Good to see you. Randall, of course. Love you guys. How are you? Pastor West. Got it going on. I love your picture in the back. Yeah, sure. Hi, hi, board members. <laughs> okay, it's it slowed down a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Ed's going to kick us off here. I got this. Hello, everyone. I'm Ed Sanders, president and co-founder of 50 Hoops. Just want to welcome you to our mobile cancer conferences and workshops, otherwise known as McCall. First, we want to thank our sponsors, Janssen, also University of South Florida, NMA, Meharry Vanderbilt, CDC Foundation, and also the Na National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS, and then also the Hip Hop Public Health Fair for the educational contributions. Now you're gonna be muted a lot, just remember that. Type your questions in the chat box. Now, as you know, Pat and I are both preacher's kids. So that means God is always in the beginning and the end. We're gonna start out our program as we normally do with an invocation. It's gonna be by Dr. Lester Singleton, senior pastor, St. Matthew's Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Singleton. Man, thank you, sir. Let's go in prayer. Lord, just being here today means that we are, are exalted in your midst. Mm -hmm. And Lord, as we start our program, we pray that your guidance and protection be upon us, our families, and 50 hoops. We pray for wisdom and we thank you for the blessings we have received. And we pray, Lord, for your continued blessing upon everyone in attendance today. And we pray you will continue to give us insight and direction respected to the path you want us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> now our theme for March, the premiere is the COVID-19 vaccine, truth or consequences. It's gonna be presented in two acts, act one today, and also act two tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Central Time. Before we get started, I wanna introduce you to our co-host and newest board member, Dr. Robin Kelly. Wave Robin so we can see you. Hey. <laughs> also, another new, bo new board member, Dr. Jason Porter, who's not here today. He's a hematologist as well as an oncologist. Finally, our illustrious NMA co-host and facilitator and friend, Dr. Doris Brown, president and CEO of Brown and Associates and past president of the National Medical Association. And remember to complete all your poll questions and surveys, very important. I'm gonna turn this portion over now to my wife, Pat, who will explain the rest of the details. Well, first of all, we want to thank everyone for your coming. We've got some serious security measures in here. So I think we're kind of locked in the house and we should be good today for those who may be wondering. I did not want to a 
webinar because I can't see all your faces and I want to see you. So we're doing everything we can to keep us all psychologically safe within this format. Um, also want to thank you for your continued support. And the big surprise is today we have a wonderful medical scientific panel and another big surprise tomorrow for which I want to thank uh, Frederick Johnson and Stand Up to Cancer for their introduction to hip hop public health and to Cassandra Harris, who's not here, and MD Anderson for their introduction to the CDC Foundation. As you know, this is not a webinar. It's a family reunion. It's a reunion of stakeholders and faith-based organization, teaching hospitals, families, and friends and it's fast paced and we call it fun and educational. There are only three things that you need to remember. One is questions and answers. The uh, speakers are going to be very brief. They're gonna highlight and overview their, their topics. So use your chat to ask questions and remember you can type it in the chat, but you can also raise your hand and Dr. Brown will call on you. You will be muted most of the time and you have about 10 seconds to ask questions so stay on topic and try to ask your questions without a lot of long comments because we have a lot to cover a lot of ground to cover we have of course ed and i some 50 dollars gift cards we always like to have a little treat and a large 50 hoops souvenir box we decided rather than giving 10 away, we're just gonna give one great big box away and it'll have a lot of goodies. So you need to be connected and your name and face needs to be visible for the drawing. Now, I wanna introduce someone who is very precious to us and that is Dr. Doris Brown. She's the president and CEO of, of Brown and Associates and past president of the National Medical Association, and she will introduce the speakers. Dr. Brown. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is really the premier 2021 Macau event. We are starting it off and love seeing all of your lovely faces. Even though we've been in shutdown, we are now almost out of it, just hold the tent rain a little bit longer. And as you've heard, this is a family affair. And if I could sing, I would do that. Um, I guess it's sliding the family stone. It's a family affair, but I can't sing, so I won't go there. I will introduce uh, this esteemed panel of scientists and medical experts that we have for you this afternoon. They're going to give you a short overview for about five minutes each. And then we will love to have your questions, but I want your questions to be put in the chat box or raise your hand. And those questions will come after we've had our minister's forum that will follow uh, right behind our scientific program. So in my three wonderful experts, uh, Dr. Kevin Sneed, and um, I think Dr. Sneed is from the University of South Florida. Dr. Randall Morgan, who's also from the National Medical Association in Sarasota, Florida, and Dr. Barney Grams, who's from the National Institutes of Health, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. They can give you a little bit more about themselves, but I wanted to spend time hearing from them rather than going into details. And I know that their bios uh, are listed in the information that you receive from uh, Pat and, and Ed. Now, what we really want to talk about is the truth about the COVID vaccine. We wanna start from lockdown, and go all the way through the vaccines that we have. And we wanna talk about the risk um, that's there for certain populations like the African-American population. And then why should you wait to get this vaccines? Uh, what are some of those myths that you've heard about the vaccines? We want to dispel all of that because it's really, really important for you to protect yourself. Um, you still have to wear your mask and wash your hand and maintain distances. So let's start off with our scientific experts. Uh, Dr. Sneed, I think you're first up. 
You're going to give us a little information on what happens uh, to COVID in your body. Uh, Dr. Morgan is going to talk about some of the risk factors, and Dr. Graham is really going to talk about the vaccines. Okay, let's get started. Dr. Sneed, you're up first. And know that I, I, I'm a very uh, strong uh, watcher of the clock, so don't let me have to turn your mic off. Absolutely. Uh, with uh, Dr. Brown, thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you and your presence. And I also want to thank um, um, both of the Sanders for, if nothing else, bringing me together with my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Morgan, even though we live right down the road from each other. Um, you know, we, we, uh, it, it's very difficult for us to get together. And so it's a great opportunity. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Sneed. I'm Dean of our Tunisia College of Pharmacy. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, um, you know, oh, one. There, uh, go back up. Yeah, there we go. Um, and we've, we've done an enormous amount of work around COVID-19, but today I'm just going to talk about what does the virus do in the body and try and dispel a little bit of myth about that. And so in this particular slide you see here, uh, we've all seen the picture of, co of the COVID virus, of the coronavirus, we call it SARS-CoV-2. We've seen the red spike on it, or it's been, been depicted as red. I want you all to think of that as being very similar to Velcro. And we all have a receptor in our body uh, called the ACE2 receptor. Uh, and that's where the particular virus attaches onto that individual receptor in the body. It's very important to note that every human being has an ACE2 receptor. And so, you know, I want to dispel the fact that whether or not uh, African Americans or, or you know, people of color, is there anything, you know, strictly unique about who we are as human beings that makes us more susceptible? No, uh, this virus has gone worldwide, as we well know. And so that attachment allows entry of that, uh, of the virus into the cells of the body. Uh, next slide, please. And so one thing I really wanted to make sure people also know is that we're talking about much more than just a respiratory virus. I know very often we look at TV in the evening and we see people going into the ICU. Uh, we see people uh, on ventilators and, and we hear about the coughing. But in this particular slide, we see all of the various areas that that uh, virus can actually attach to and damage. Uh, we've all heard about people that have the neurological issues, especially around taste and smell and headaches. Um, but we don't hear nearly as much about the kidney injury that can result. Uh, some of the earliest things we noticed that more than a year ago as a clinician uh, was the fact that many people wind up developing uh, diarrhea symptoms, another GI distress. But then in uh, March and April of last year, reports started coming out. Uh, the first one I read was in the Philadelphia area, but then quickly extended up into the New York area about the clotting that occurred. Uh, and it was clotting, it was very diffuse all throughout the body. There were micro clotting uh, uh, components that were occurring. So we just needed to really understand that this did much more than just be, uh, be a respiratory virus. And then finally, I'll bring attention to the fact that uh, cardiac in nature, it can attach onto the cardiac tissue. It's really important to also really, understand that other virus can cause myocarditis. It's important okay. to understand that other viruses so can cause myocarditis. Could you turn your, your mute on, please? Yeah, yeah, whoever's talking. Yeah, I think what happened is. Um... Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Dr. Yes. Sneed, please. Yes. Go so ahead. again, I was saying it's very important to understand that um, yeah, other viruses can cause myocarditis or inflammation of the cardiac tissue. Uh, but that happens in about maybe up to 1% of, of people that get the flu. What we found is that anywhere from 22 to 35% of individuals who have been affected by COVID-19 may develop these uh, cardiac conditions. Uh, next slide, please. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Here you go. And so here in this particular image, uh, I really wanted to kind of bring home the fact that we're dealing with far more than just a, a respiratory uh, virus. So again, I talked about it being able to attach onto the heart. Uh, we see the kidneys and the lungs there involved, and also the vasculature. So when we're actually thinking about this particular virus, we have to respect the fact that uh, the long hauler effects, the COVID uh, long-term effects that can occur, uh, can actually affect various parts of the body and can actually cause uh, far more damage than we, than we uh, most people in the public are giving it credit for. Uh, next slide, please. And so one of the very final things I would like to say, and I'm going to turn it over in just a moment to my, my good friend, I believe Dr. Morgan, 
is that once that virus gains entry into the cell, and you can see, uh, and this is what viruses do if they're RNA based, it will unfurl and then that, that RNA strand, it will then gather proteins all from throughout your body or from that particular cell. And then it will begin to replicate. Now, one end doesn't mean one out. One end could be a thousand out or tens of thousands. We don't know, but um, to be perfectly honest, uh, the, the human body can be overrun by this virus very quickly. And the cell that is gathering the proteins from as it begins to referral and actually um, uh, exit from that cell will actually lead to cell death of that particular cell. And again, not to go into belabor it too long, but we find all of the various medications that were already on the market and where we tried to uh, repurpose many of the medications to try and fight against uh, this particular virus. But of all the ones shown here, only about two really have kind of shaken out uh, and proven to be somewhat efficacious. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me. I don't know why it's not going. I'm so sorry. Oh. Hold on just a second, doctor. Sorry. There you go. I'm sorry. Yeah, and so um, I believe again, uh, I think Dr. Morgan, and uh, just for time's sake, Pat, you can go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, but it, it can cause uh, what we call cytokine storm, which we're really concerned about, which is, uh, really is a revving up of the inflammatory condition. And then finally, here, I, I wrote an article, an open article about a year ago that really began to spell out that when you have these cardiac conditions and people become infected with COVID-19, and we can, if we have people with diabetes and high blood pressure and other conditions that already uh, set the stage for inflammatory proteins to be present, that we really can uh, wind up having a, a very particular problem. And I overlapped uh, where many of the early cases were against where many of our cardiovascular cases are. And it wasn't very surprising to find out why, why black and brown people were some of the most affected at that time. Uh, I'm gonna stop right there. Uh, I think on the final slide, it's just me trying to uh, show people that yes, I indeed did get the uh, COVID-19, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, yeah, the COVID-19 vaccine myself. Uh, but we can stop right there and we will turn it over to the next presenter. But thank you very much for your attention. Thank you okay. so much, Dr. Smith. Thank you. Yes. Dr. It. Morgan, who's uh, president and uh, CEO of uh, the W. Montague Cobb National Medical Association Research Institute. Dr. Morgan, you're on mute. Good afternoon. Um, Thank you very much, Dr. Brown, and uh, also Dr. Sneed, um, and uh, Pat and Ed, thank you for the invitation again to be on this uh, uh, program with such distinguished uh, speakers and also distinguished attendees. Um, I have been involved with the Cobb Institute for the past 13 months uh, working with COVID-19. And the first thing I will say is that we all have learned a significant amount. And we've learned a lot through collaboration. So I've had an opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Sneed and his team in Tampa, and also Dr. Bar um, Dr. Barney Graham. And I've learned so much through the working with colleagues uh, that it emphasizes uh, the reason that we're here today to, in a rather relaxed fashion, ex uh, just exchange information and, um, and all of us grow, not only as clinicians, but as patients. So this uh, COVID-19 has been a significant, uh, uh, has had a significant impact certainly on our lives and on the world. And it has created as far as African-Americans are concerned, what we call a tri-pandemic uh, because it's the virus, it's also the comorbidities and, and Dr. Sneed just uh, laid that whole thing out in terms of the comorbidities, the diabetes, the hypertension, the uh, uh, heart disease, um, and obesity uh, that can uh, so seriously affect uh, individuals who are exposed to the COVID-19 uh, virus. And then finally, there's the systemic racism. Uh, so the three together have been almost a knockout punch for the African-American uh, community. And, and so the Cobb Institute, the National Medical Association and many of the other organizations have, have not only been trying to learn more about the virus, but learn more about 
how we can mitigate the impact of the virus in our communities. Because as a Cobb Institute, we've been focused from the very beginning on this social determinants of health. And so <clears throat> that's kind of what I will highlight in the few, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in the few minutes that, uh, that I speak. Um, but we know that uh, in addition to the comorbidities, uh, which are fairly clear, we also know that there has been a significant decrease in access to healthcare uh, throughout this past 12 to 13 months. So it's led to delayed diagnoses and treatment of certain of the comorbid conditions. So these conditions uh, have become worse uh, because people have not been under medical care. And particularly for African-American patients who don't have the same access, they don't always have access to telemedicine, they can't always get an appointment with their private physicians. Um, so there's been uh, a, a disconnect between the community and, and, the, and the healthcare community uh, so that we're sure that there are a number of mortalities that are not uh, directly uh, stated to be uh, re uh, a result of COVID, uh, but they are a result of the situation. Uh, there's also been the hesitancy to obtain immediate treatment. Uh, we found uh, that if you are able to treat uh, COVID-19 early uh, with some of the medications that are available, uh, it will certainly uh, greatly improve the out, uh, outcome and decrease the death rate. Uh, but if individuals are not treated in the first seven to 10 days, they lose the opportunity for uh, many of these medications uh, that can make a difference. Um, also, individuals work in high-risk occupations. We already know that, not only in healthcare, but in transportation, uh, food production, uh, construction, um, and they have to go to work every day. So they don't have the opportunity to, to stay at home and, and, uh, and work from uh, a laptop like uh, many of us uh, do. Although I must say that I think we all have overworked since we're only working now from our laptop We've double and triple scheduled ourselves. And so it may be healthier for us to get back to, uh, to work. But in reality, it would be nice to have that choice for some people and they have not had that choice. And certainly people live in, in challenging environments um, with uh, uh, multi-generational housing, uh, with uh, housing that is already impacted by the environment. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, heat, the atmosphere, uh, other toxins that may be um, in the area that uh, subsequently affect uh, to a greater extent uh, uh, how they may recover from COVID-19. Um, I wanna just highlight a couple of uh, areas that have become very, that I've been very focused upon and the Cobb Institute as well. And one of them is uh, the mental health stress. Um, that has affected the black community in particular um, after the COVID-19 uh, um, virus um, has crept into our community uh, so thoroughly. Uh, we've had two or three webinars uh, for the Cobb Institute uh, about mental health and the attendance has been greater on those webinars than any other webinars uh, that we have had. And each of the webinars then creates a, a, a desire for another and answer many questions. Unfortunately, we have uh, significant uh, talent uh, in the National Medical Association and the Cobb Institute with regard to mental health and our board chair, Dr. Ron Bailey and, and others uh, who have really contributed a lot to our knowledge. Um, but certainly this is something that we need to focus upon um, at I think with this group going forward is, is the uh, concurrent mental health uh, challenge in our community. And, and then finally, um, early on, uh, the NCAA and other athletic um, 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 enterprises found that there was uh, a higher incidence of uh, cardiomyopathy 
in many of the athletes and particularly young African-American males uh, who are in sports, basketball, football and the like uh, were having uh, difficulties um, and having difficulties recovering from the virus. And so I think the fact that Dr. Sneed showed the pathophysiology of the virus and all the different organ systems that can be involved, uh, people just don't get over it like it's the flu. And even though you may be an All-American basketball player, uh, if you are affected by this cardiomyopathy, it could ruin your not only your opportunity to get an education, but certainly an opportunity to be a professional athlete. So there are many different aspects of COVID-19 that have affected our lives. But what we know as far as the Cobb Institute is concerned is that we have to keep working with our partners. We have to keep looking at what we call the uh, aftermath of the tsunami. What's gonna occur in our communities over the next two to three years? How will we have to rebuild and what's the smartest way to rebuild the community? So with that, um, Thank you very much, and uh, I'll be uh, anxious to participate in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. And now we will hear from Dr. Uh, Graham, and um, I believe Dr. Graham is going to have some slides, and he might need to share screen. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Dr. Graham. Thank you, Dr. Brown, and um, I'm very honored to be here with you and joining this time uh, to talk about the vaccines. And uh, I've had the privilege to work with Dr. Brown and Dr. Morgan over this past few months on the Coronavirus Prevention Trials Community Engagement Group. I'll, I'll just try to answer two questions that are commonly asked, and then we can answer more later um, if they come up. One is, um, how did we go so fast on the vaccine development? And we did go fast. This is a, a record speed for going from scratch to a vaccine that can actually be used. And uh, it started on the 10th of January, and uh, it was based on three years of work we had done with Moderna prior to that time, looking at an mRNA vaccine for the MERS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. And uh, we had already shown that the mRNA delivery of that spike protein could protect animals from infection with the MERS coronavirus. That work was based on three years of studying the spike protein of other coronaviruses and defining the structure of that protein, meaning how, what its shape is, uh, in great, great detail and learning how to do the protein engineering to hold it in that right shape. That work was based on three years of other work on another virus called respiratory syncytial virus in which it has a, a fusion protein that's analogous to the spike protein in which we did the same thing. And it's the reason we moved to coronavirus to show it in a different family of viruses. And that work was really made possible by 20 years of work on HIV vaccine development. And even though it's not been successful, it has generated a lot of the technologies that are now available to do things in a different way. And so being able to start rapidly and to do our demonstration project with Moderna, we knew each other. They trusted our judgment. We gave them a sequence, and in three days, they decided, uh, uh, made the decision to start manufacturing. It was made possible then by a large amount of money that came into the system, allowing uh, decisions to be made uh, in parallel and both animal sit models and, and uh, clinical trials to be done in parallel, allowing. Uh, a process that usually is done serially or sequentially because there's so much money at risk. And so uh, with, the, with all the money put into the system, those decisions could be made and things could be done in parallel. But if you look at the data, if you look at the size of the trials uh, that have now enrolled over 200,000 people into randomized clinical trials, and if you look at the data packages, both from the animals and the people and the level of efficacy and the level of safety, uh, this is one of the 
best studied vaccines that I've seen in my 35 years of doing this kind of work. And so I don't think any steps have been skipped uh, in terms of safety. And, and so the, the reason we could go fast is because of the prior knowledge and the prior work, prior relationships and the large infusion of cash. And so um, I'll just uh, I'll stop there unless I, you can let me answer one more question that I know will come up later. And that is, why should you be vaccinated? Why, why does that really matter? And over the next three to five years, probably everybody on earth is gonna have immunity of some sort to this coronavirus. And it's either gonna come through a vaccination or an infection. And so the choice you have is not to be vaccinated or not vaccinated, it's to be vaccinated or to be infected. And if you're infected, you just heard Dr. Sneed tell you the things that can happen, but you're risking a one or 2% chance of dying uh, or even higher if you're older or have risk factors. And you're also risking a 20% chance of having long-term symptoms that you just heard, heard a lot about. And the risk of the vaccines that we uh, know about right now are occasionally uh, very severe uh, allergic reactions that can be life-threatening that happen about three out of a million times, and that can be treated successfully. And so your choices between pretty high death rate, pretty high risk of uh, uh, long-term symptoms, or a three out of a million chance of having a severe allergic reaction that can be treated. That's the decision I think people have to make at a, at a fundamental level. Thank you so much. We have lots of questions that's going to come just after we hear from our pastors. And we know that uh, we as a people, put our faith in the church. And so today we wanna to have our ministers forum that's gonna talk about what's going on in their congregation and some of the stories they have been hearing. Um, I have six wonderful, delightful pastors and I know that you all wanna preach a sermon, but this is just a little sermonette that we're gonna ask you for this afternoon. So let's start off and I'm gonna name all of you and you'll come in order. Uh, we have Pastor Bartholomew Orr from the Brown Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis. Uh, we have Pastor West from here in DC at Mount Airy Baptist Church. Uh, Pastor Lawrence Robinson from Potter's House in Dallas. Um, Pastor Jacqueline Thompson from Allen Temple Baptist Church in uh, Oakland, California. Pastor Jamal Weathersby from New Hope uh, Missionary Baptist Church in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and Bishop Ronald Godby from the River Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. So we'll start off with Pastor Orr. Just give us a little two or three minute overview, and then we're going to have questions for everyone. We we have yeah. taken we have taken a very hands-on active approach in this North Mississippi, um, South Memphis area that we live in. We actually border on two states. So we have, we have uh, restrictions lifted in Mississippi, but a lot of restrictions in Tennessee, but we are encouraged in vaccine. I've been vaccinated um, with both shots and we've chronicled that social media, but we're also partnering with our hospitals to uh, link up with them and provide it. And then in Memphis, we've actually uh, provided our database so that members there that are at risk can actually be called and actually have the people come to their homes to be vaccinated as well. So we've taken a very hands-on approach to really, and we're still practicing all of our safety guidelines, even in all of our worship, although the restrictions have been lifted. Thank you so much. Okay, Pastor West from Mount Airy. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And we certainly want to thank Pat and Ed for, uh, again, staging an outstanding, um, an outstanding meeting, an outstanding workshop. Thank you so very much. At the Mount Airy Church, we have been working uh, to do three things to inform, to educate, 
and to engage uh, our people of the church as well as the people uh, in the community. Working through our health education ministry, which is a very, very proactive uh, ministry headed by your new board member, Dr. Robin Kelly, who does an outstanding job of keeping uh, our parishioners as well as all constituents in the community, keeping them informed. We provide information from our mouths, our mouths to people, people's ears. And uh, Dr., Dr. Brown has said it, and that is that uh, there's a trust factor that's already built up. Um, and that which is not built up, we're continuing to work day by day to make certain that people can trust what they are hearing coming from God's church. Not only do we inform, but we educate. We provide uh, through, again, through our health education ministry, uh, provide scientific data as best that we possibly can. Uh, we're not counting on people reading everything they get their hands on. And just in case they don't read, we like to tell them. So we know they will hear it, and they'll hear it from mouths that uh, they can trust. The church has put on virtual workshops uh, with medical professionals. I'm, uh, I was ex tremendously excited to, to, to hear that Dr. Porter was going to be a part, but unfortunately he's not here on this day, but he was a part of our workshop one of our workshops that uh, Dr. Kelly and her team uh, brought, to, uh, brought to the Mount Airy Church. Um, we look for people uh, in which we can serve so that we can educate them. And then lastly, we look to also engage people. Uh, we look for that, I like that hands-on uh, kind of mentality that was just mentioned by the previous pastor. We like to provide caring and um, an informative personal interaction uh, regarding who is interested in taking the vaccine, who's having challenges regarding receiving or taking the vaccine, or who's even questioning have, uh, taking the vaccine. Because we firmly believe that there's a greater risk in not taking the vaccine than certainly taking the vaccine. We engage our seniors, which certainly is a vulnerable population, but we engage them to see if they are having any problems making appointments. And if they are, we get involved uh, to show them how much we care uh, and how important this is to us their safe and their safety and their well-being, how important that is to us. So we get involved with them and helping them to make their appointments and even to offer them transportation should they need it uh, to go to, uh, to an appointment. Uh, there is much, much more. We're involved with several different uh, uh, organizations in, in, in partnering individually as well as partnering as a church. So I'll stop here because uh, my two minutes, I don't want, I don't want Dr. Brown to have to mute me. <laughs> it was coming. It was coming. So thank you. Thank you very much again for having us and allowing us to participate in this matter. Thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Pastor Lawrence Robinson. Uh, he's not, he's not on today. He's, he's not on. Been, okay. Uh, Pastor Jacqueline Thompson. It's Pastor Thompson. I'm looking for you. Oh, there, yes. you're muted. There, there you go. Thank you. Yes, Good morning, I can hear you now. Everyone, I certainly want to give my thanks to Brother Ed for having me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. I'm trying to make you a uh, speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I think. I'm trying to make it. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, I'm I'm saying good morning and I'm saying thank you so much for being here. Thank you to the ah. tremendous panel that we are on. Forgive me being in and out. We are vaccinating as I speak. 
And so Allen Temple was challenged. Uh, we started out testing when the COVID pandemic first hit. And so that was about May of 2020. We were able to test about 30,000 people, predominantly African-American and people of color. So it was a natural transition for us when vaccination became an issue for us to begin engaging in vaccinations. So we currently vaccinate on our site three days a week. Um, and to date, this, we're going on our third week. And to date, we've vaccinated close to 5,000 people, predominantly African-American and people of color. And similar to Pastor West, there are three kind of areas where we have been focused. The first is awareness. Just making sure that people have information about the vaccinations, how they differ from traditional vaccinations. We're grateful for the relationships we have with our healthcare entities in the area, as well as our governmental partners in the area. The second is advocacy, because one thing we have found in our area is that there is not equitable access that even though vaccines are being given, they are not being equitably distributed to the persons who are highest impacted. And in our community in particular, it is African-Americans in the Latino community. And so we do a lot of advocacy to make sure that vaccines are being brought to the people and have to go searching and have to go all kinds of different places in order to receive it. And so in addition to, you know, like everyone, virtual workshops, things like this, where our people are able to come on and learn more about the vaccine. We do a lot of engagement around what it means to be a believer and be committed to saving and preserving lives because that's what it has been really about for us. We have lost persons to this disease. We have seen it, as many of you firsthand, the impact that it has had. And we have to be about the business of saving our own lives. And so we try and help people understand we are not saying that the vaccination will make you immune. We are saying that it will decrease the chance of you losing your life to the disease. So in the same way you take your hypertension medication, not that it's hey. going to take your hypertension away, go. but it's going to keep you from the effects of it. The same go. for diabetes, the same for any other disease that we have. And so helping the community not have the fear, we understand the historical distrust and we don't try to dismiss that. We understand we are a people who have been victimized in this area. So we acknowledge that and we affirm that and we try to use education as the tool and the weapon to empower people, not to force them to do it, but to make sure they have full agency to make the decision that is going to be best for them. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Pastor Jamal Weathersby. Hey. Where is Dr. Pastor Weathersby? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, there you are. <laughs> grateful to be on with you guys. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Ed. Thank you all, uh, the uh, esteemed guests and panelists. And, uh, you know, the, the, pa the previous pastors, they pretty much stole all of my thunder. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, uh, uh, but uh, so basically, throughout this time, we've, uh, we've, uh, We've done food distribution. We've done testing. We've done. We're doing vaccines as well today. Um, we've partnered with hospitals uh, just to make sure that uh, everything that's available to our community, uh, we can be a part uh, in making sure that they uh, they're able to to get those resources. Uh, our service. I, I like to talk about what our services look like right now. Uh, you know, we were suspended for a good amount of time, uh, but uh, we actually came back to in-person worship in some form in June. And that, that has actually worked out pretty good. Gradually, we've grown uh, the number of people that we've been allowed, uh, that we've allowed in our, our sanctuary. Of course, we're socially distant. We're wearing masks. We have hand sanitizers uh, throughout the sanctuary. We do temperature checks. Uh, contact tracing, um, and we've had shortened services. I don't think we'll ever go back to long services again. Uh, we were just told recently, uh, as Sunday, as recent as Sunday, uh, that many of those um, got the, many of the guidelines have changed. So they, our, our city has told us that we don't even have to do contact tracing anymore, temperature checks. Uh, but I think we're going to still keep those in place. We did suspend some of our ministries, such as Sunday school and our transportation ministries no longer uh, picking up our members and we no, long, no longer have uh, a full choir. 
uh, participating in the worship service. Uh, but we hope to get back to those things really soon as uh, our numbers uh, get better. Uh, so that's basically the, uh, the the outlook of our of our church and some of the things that we've done uh, throughout throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Thank now bringing up our pastors ministers forum is Bishop Godby from uh, North Carolina. And I and saw him. I am here. And you talk yes, about yes. someone who has no thunder. They put me at the end. But it's <laughs> great to hear the commitment and the uh, response to the call that has been issued to the body of Christ and how my colleagues have responded. We too have had to learn how to reset and exist in this COVID era. And that caused us to have to discover how can we repair in certain areas. So where could we support? And so we had to analyze and examine our community as well as our congregation to build out and develop responses to the areas that we had been critically devastated in throughout the COVID era. Then we had to discover how we reach and we had to learn how to use our social media and all of the tools and the resources that were available to us to leverage a response to the COVID scenario, of which we did, um, creating opportunities for us to have clear conversation, not only about the scientific facts that were surrounding the issue, but also about the concerns that were reared in our community and rightfully so to give our congregation, our community, to have an opportunity to give address uh, in front of professionals to ask their questions, no matter how simple or how complex, uh, but to have their issues addressed uh, and to have their concerns addressed. And so we utilize all of our resources to educate and to equip our congregation with not only the information that they would need, but also with the theological response uh, which is something that we thought was missing from the conversation. Uh, we wanted to provide a theological response and the responsibility of the Christian community uh, for the COVID era. That then caused us to be led to our conversation about re-entry. What would systems and protocols look like in taking advantage of our professional uh, access? We leveraged that to build out a very robust system to where we could actively engage and, and re-enter into our worship experience, which we were able to do so back in August of 2020. And we have done so to date without any COVID incidents in our congregation. We have been deemed by some of the healthcare professionals to be one of the safest places in the city of Durham. And lastly, we then were led to our conversation about how do we rehabilitate and reorient our congregation as they are re-entering because we didn't wanna just throw them back into a scenario when they had been away from each other for so long. And so we crafted a wonderful system and to date we have had zero incidents and we are worshiping in a way like we've never done before. So thank you for this time and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank, you. Um, thank to all, all of our ministers of for the wonderful you. information. We're going to go into our question and answers, but we're going to have this to be led off by our faith-based national network coordinators. And this is a, an area that most uh, groups don't have, is these national coordinators that are listening to what's going on in the community. So I'm gonna call their names and I wanna intermingle some questions. I've gotten the questions out of the chat and we're gonna go with that. But we have Sheila Patterson from Oak Cliff Baptist I mean, excuse me, Bible Fellowship that's in Dallas. We have Virginia Bradford from the Black Nurses Association in Louisville, Kentucky. We have Deacon Harold Goodwin from the Allen Temple uh, Church in Oakland. Uh, Danita Brown from the Brown Missionary Baptist Church in South Haven. And uh, Robin Kelly from Mount Airy. Um, so let's... Um, go with some of the questions and there's going to be another poll coming in and while she's putting that poll in i'm going to ask my scientific uh, uh panelists if they could give some information on SARS-CoV-2 in patients who are taking ARBs as a, a treatment 
for their hypertension. And just uh, since that's good, Dr. Sneed, Dr. Yes. Uh, Goodwin, I mean, Dr. Randall Morgan, or um, yeah, Dr. That, Graham, want to answer that? that? I see Dr. Sneed has his. Yeah, I, go I'll, ahead. I'll, 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 I'll be happy to take the first stab at that. You know, very early on, about a year ago, uh, that became one of the, the first and most important questions we needed to answer. Uh, because of that ACE2 receptor I showed them as part of my presentation. And we know that there's an interplay with ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker medications uh, with these various receptors. Um, we discovered pretty quickly and through, uh, through a lot of review that really those medications did not have an effect one way or the other. And we recommended that people continue taking the medication but not depend on the medication at all in terms of being prophylactic against the SARS-CoV-2. Um, the recommendation number one was to continue taking those medications if they had been prescribed for high blood pressure or for other kidney conditions. And also, and the very final thing, and I'll invite uh, my two other panelists to, uh, to, to add in, uh, I think the very final thing I, I would like to mention is that uh, if you don't, that, that little receptor that, that the virus is attaching onto, if you don't have enough of that in your body, if it begins to downregulate, you actually allow more inflammation to occur in the body. And it's the inflammation in the body and inflammation specific to these organ systems that winds up causing such a very deleterious effect in both long-term and in the short-term that puts people in the hospital. And so uh, the recommendation at that time was do not pay attention to ACE inhibitor or ARB use. If you were using it for high blood pressure use, continue using it, number one. Number two, don't depend on that medication as a potential treatment that could prevent you from, being, from becoming infected. Okay. That's a great question. Great. Okay. Um, any of my network coordinators have any comments from uh, people they're hearing in the community before I give you another question that I see in the chat box? I started a, a question, well, a concern. Okay. Um, we, we have heard that there are two vaccines that did not utilize, well, yes, did not utilize aborted fetuses as their testing. Uh, most of the, the majority of the people at our church are wanting to get vaccine. I have, I'm a 1B. Uh, we have been given the opportunity to go to Cooper Institute and take testing because we are very safe conscious at Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship with 9,000 members. It is very difficult to have social distancing. We have registered some, but we do not have the opportunity, the enough room for everyone to come to our church. We have even had UT Southwest agree to bring it to our church if we had the area to do it. So. That is some of our concerns. We, the people want it. They are concerned about um, the, the aborted fetuses used. Um, I'm not gonna say which two did, but the others, we do not have any confirmation that that was not utilized. So um, if anyone can. Dr. Graham, would you like to take yes. that? That's another one of those myths that we've been hearing. Yeah. Yes, yes I, I can say something about that. And um, I appreciate the concern that's been something that's come up or, around vaccines for, for many, many years. The mRNA vaccines that would come from Moderna or Pfizer are yeah. chemically synthesized and they do not have any connection with a cell that would have come from an aborted fetus. Yes, we know but that. The new, the new vaccines that would be coming from Novavax or eventually from Sanofi are protein-based vaccines, but they're made in insect cells. So they don't have anything to do with any type of aborted fetus. The adenovirus vaccines that would come from AstraZeneca or uh, Janssen or J&J, those adenoviruses um, that carry the gene that encodes the spike protein to carry it, help carry it into the cell, the adenovirus itself hasn't come from an aborted fetus, but the cell lines that they have to use in the factory to grow the adenovirus or originally were derived from aborted fetal tissue back in the 1980s, very long time ago. Okay. And those cell lines have been passaged in 
test tubes uh, over 40 years, and um, and it is what what it is. Those cell lines are are classically used, historically used to be able to grow the adenovirus vectors in enough quantity to use them as a vaccine. So I don't, uh, you know, you ha you have to make your own judgment about what what that means for you, but at least some of the vaccines are not connected to the fetal tissue in any way. Dr. Graham, while you're on that, I had a question. Uh, Henrietta Lacks, how is, that, how is that different from the aborted female, the cells that they harvested for the polio vaccine and some of the others? Right, well, um, some of our licensed vaccines are made in um, some of the same types of tissues that may have come from an aborted fetus many, many decades ago. Henrietta Lacks uh, tissue came from a cervical cancer that she had and that she died of. And that, that the cells in her cancer um, were taken out and put into uh, these petri dishes and, and test tubes, and those cells just continued to grow. And they have grown and grown and grown. In fact, um, some of the cell lines that we thought we had from other places are probably taken over by those HeLa cells that came from Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. So those cells are used extensively in biomedical research. They have not really been used in this particular research. Uh, the adenovirus doesn't grow in those cells. Uh, as I said, the mRNA is done uh, by chemical synthesis. And so those cells uh, at some level in some way indirectly probably are connected to these vaccines because those cells are connected to just about everything that's done in biomedical research, but there's no direct connection to those cells for any of these vaccines. And just to add that those HeLa cells certainly have been used in cancer research as a medical oncologist. We have developed a, a significant number of therapies that have come from the HeLa cells. And so it's very important that we know um, this is what's allowing us to treat several diseases that we have now. Um, let's go to another question. Uh, Dr. Morgan, um, can you speak a little bit more about the mental health challenges in African-Americans and um, also at all levels, if you will? Sure, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, we found uh, from our clinicians and experts and also from uh, clergy and others that we are collaborating with in the communities that uh, mental health challenges affect all ages. And to a certain extent, it's because of the uh, variation in um, our daily experiences and lives uh, that have increased the amount of stress. Uh, certainly, uh, the intimate partner vi uh, violence or other types of violence has been one of the areas that has been uh, significantly spoken of. Uh, another that we uh, have learned about are the mental health issues that affect children uh, because of the effect uh, of not going to school and not having that community um, uh, interaction uh, and being only uh, somewhat isolated uh, at their homes uh, with a screen if, if, uh, if they had one available to them. And oftentimes being uh, uh, without their parents or, or other providers uh, because of the need for them to work. So I think it's um, the crowding, it's, it's the, the isolation, it's the, the loss of, of camaraderie and seniors. Certainly there's been a significant amount of depression uh, because of isolation and not being able to see their families and uh, hug and communicate. Um, so it's affected uh, almost every, um, every segment of our community. Okay. Um, are there other questions from my network coordinators before I ask another question from the chat box? Yeah, I haven't. Okay, Danita Brown. Okay, thank you, how y'all doing? Okay. The question I have is that a lot of people are taking the first shot. They're going to get their first dose. 
And the fear is what happens when you take that second dose. Uh, some of us get a little sick and some of us do not. So that's a big concern. A lot of people are taking the first dose, but they're not going back. And uh, what can we do? You know, is there a difference in the type that the Moderna or the, uh, Moderna or the Pfizer? Is there a difference? Some people now are waiting on the Johnson. Right. Dr. Tran. Well, the, the uh, or Dr. Morgan, do you want to answer that? No, go right ahead, Dr. Graham. I'll... Well, so the, the mRNA vaccines, um, the Pfizer and the Moderna are very, very similar. They both have the same protein design that that came out of our lab at NIH and that uh, maybe you know about her, but Dr. Kizmikia Corbett's a research fellow in my lab and she's been very much involved in that process over the last several years. And so they both have the same protein design, they both have the same type of RNA and they both have very similar uh, lipids that hold the RNA together and protect it. And so those two vaccines cause about the same thing. And on the second dose in the mRNAs, you do get more reactions. You get more of a sore arm, you get more of a red arm, and it, you also get more, those are local, and then you have systemic reactions. And so you can get chills and fever and muscle aches and uh, tiredness or fatigue. And, and those things usually last about 24 to 36 hours and then they're gone. And so those things do happen after the second dose of the mRNA and, and uh, they are bothersome, but some people also celebrate them because it means something good is happening. And, and uh, in the people who don't react and, and about 40% of people don't have really any side effects, uh, they're also making immune responses. It just doesn't manifest in the same way in their side effects. So they're all making um, good immune responses. Now, if you only take that first dose, you, you may not hit your peak immune response. You may go up a certain amount, and we know there's some protection from the first dose, even of the RNA but you really need that second dose to boost it to a higher level and make sure it lasts a, a long time. So a single dose may not last very long. Now the J&J &J vaccine, it is a single dose vaccine. The AstraZeneca, which is also an adenovirus, it'll be a two dose vaccine and J&J &J is studying theirs as a two dose vaccine in Europe. But for the adenovirus vectors, most of the reactions are on the first dose. You don't get as many on the second dose. And so uh, those side effects uh, that happen are, are a sign that your immune system is responding and working. And, and it is annoying. Uh, my daughter was mad at me for a couple of days after her second injection because she didn't feel good. And, uh, but that's kind of the price you pay for being protected from the virus. Ms. Brown, can I add on something very quickly? Yes, uh, go right ahead. I just want—I just want to add on. Of course, uh, we appreciate you know Dr. Graham and the work that, that, that he's contributed to this discussion. But we also have to you know just just keep in mind, we, and we have to the way it, I think it's more about how we communicate to our people about what these potential adverse effects are. Uh, very often, and I want to acknowledge um, my my we care partner here, Dr. Angela Hill, who's here with me today. Uh, when we're communicating in the public, and we've done about 60 uh, community presentations, and we always tell them, if you feel it, that's a good thing, but there is nothing worse than actually getting infected by the actual virus, okay? So if a person were to get infected by the actual virus, they would have almost very similar symptoms, but the outcome is going to be far worse. There is nothing worse than getting infected by the virus when you compare it to the vaccine. So I think the communication of how we're telling people up front about that second dose is extremely important. We don't want people getting infected by the virus. And for a, a potential 36 hours up to, you know, you are now protected against very severe disease going into the hospital and potential death. So thank you very much for that question. And I think, uh, again, Dr. Dr. Graham, um, just said it beautifully. 
Okay. I wanted, Dr. Brown, I just wanted to make a short comment about this as well, is that I've been reading, certainly even in our local press now, that that some vaccine uh, appointments are going unused. And that is really a, a concern. So one reason could be that people are registering in multiple places to be vaccinated, just to try to get vaccinated. But second could be those that are not getting the second dose because they're um, concerned about the uh, side effects. And so I think we have to continue to carry that message uh, that it's important uh, that the entire, as Dr. Graham has explained, uh, there's a reason why there are two in, uh, injections for, for certain vaccines and why there's one for another vaccine. But if you go off script, so to speak, uh, you are not at all getting the, the maximum effect in protecting yourself uh, by, uh, by getting vaccinated. So I, I think that has to be our message. Okay, yes. Um, well, we're getting near the end of time, but uh, there are a couple of questions that's here. Uh, can any of you speak to the long-term side effects from the vaccines? Not that we know, we haven't had them around that long, but long-term side effects. Well, right. The, the vaccines haven't been tested in this way. Uh, the, the coronavirus vaccines haven't been tested for, uh, they just started about a year ago, March 16th of 2020. So we're still looking at that. Most vaccine side effects happen within six weeks. 99.9% .9 of vaccine side effects historically have happened within six to eight weeks. There has been mRNA vaccine studies uh, for about 10 years, and there's been DNA vaccine studies for about uh, over 20 years. And there's been adenovirus vaccine studies for about 30 years. So these vaccines are a little new in terms of being used in this scale, but they have been used in uh, clinical studies over a long time. And I'm not aware of any long-term side effects from the DNA vaccines, the RNA vaccines, or the adenovirus vaccines that have really been documented uh, to be associated with the vaccine. So. We don't know about this particular vaccine yet because we have to, to watch and see, but I think as Dr. Sneed said very well, um, whatever the case, the virus is a lot worse than the vaccine. Okay, a uh, question about um, strategies uh, to reach the homebound. Can you speak to that, particularly the access and distribution issues? Uh, we've been talking about hesitancy, but I think one real issue is um, distribution and the easy access. Any of the panelists? Yeah, I, I, I'll speak to that very briefly. Um, uh, even right now here at the University of South Florida, um, myself, again, along with Dr. Hill, we're developing uh, kind of a heat mapping uh, program that we can go out and, and begin to, number one, target at-risk communities. Uh, number one, and then most recently, we're trying to figure out how many different uh, nonprofit organizations are already filtering out into those areas, and can we partner with them to identify individuals? And if we do, and when we do, uh, now we're developing and partnering with other people to get directly into into the home. So that can be a Meals on Wheels. Uh, that can be part of the Department of Health. There are a lot of avenues that we want to use, but the most important thing we need to do is identify who's out there and then find out who they are because more than likely they're not gonna be able to identify us and get to us. And that becomes part of the barrier uh, that many people of color, especially in our African American and Latino communities are experiencing. They may not even have Wi-Fi in, the, in their location and we're expecting them to go online and register. So we're using some uh, you know, heat mapping, uh, GIS type, type uh, uh, technology to begin to identify where they are um, send people into the community and then ask the question, do you want it? If they say, yes, I do, we'll get people there. If they say, no, we don't, then we can come in with additional education. Again, Dr. Hill and I through We Care are, have been very adept at getting that done. So uh, I'll invite uh, Dr. Morgan or, or Dr. Graham to, to say anything else, but, but we have to get more imaginative than we've done um, presently and currently uh, to, to make sure that we get access to the homebound. And 
And if I can okay. add, the city of Memphis is actually working with churches uh, to reach out to their homebound list. So they have actually reached out to churches. If you have those that are homebound and they are offering those in-home shots for those individuals. Okay. Can I say something, Dr. Brown? Yes, please. Thank you all so much for your responses. This has been awesome. Um, I love the, the comment that you made about churches um, providing the list of their homebound, but then how do they access the vaccine? And you don't have to answer it now. I mean, I've been reaching out to our city government asking how are we reaching? Because even if a church identifies the list, then is how does the list the individuals actually receive the vaccine? Because we have the vaccine. We're just not getting it into the arms of the most high risk individuals. And so, you know, what can we do about that? They, they, um, actually, have, they actually have assigned nurses that are actually mm -hmm. going into the home. So once that list is provided through this program that they're working specifically with clergy and congregation, that is the follow up that the person will receive the vaccination. You know, and that, I would also add, Dr. Cooper, and, Dr. Uh, Cooper, I would also add in California, excuse my picture being off, mm -hmm. as I said, we're vaccinating now, so I'm popping in and out. Most of the, at least the city and the county and even some of the state agencies have access to mobile units. And so one of the things that we have done, we spent a lot of time advocating, pressuring, here advocating and pressuring is almost shaming our local <laughs> governments into making sure that some of those mobile units, some of those pop-ups, some of those things that are happening around the community are dedicated to those who are homebound. We sit in one of the highest affected, highest impact zip codes in our area. So a part of the reason we were able to get vaccinations is because we were able to advocate and to lobby. So as a part of our mobile unit for people who are not able to come to us, there is a team that can be dispatched from our mobile unit to go into our local area for those who are interested in vaccinations and who have signed up that way. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you look at it, for homebound, we almost have to, to leave the technological advances that we have and go back to the old school word of mouth, phone calling, who do we know? Because they have the vaccine, but when we ask them what is the strategy, to be honest, they're depending on us for the strategy. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes they have not done for this work. And so it's an opportunity for us to help them be creative. Um, and of course, to partner with them in ways to do that, similar to what uh, Pastor Orr had mentioned as well. There are agencies willing to do it, but we have to say to them, we need your mobile pop-up here in this particular area, wherever the hot spot is for you in DC. Yeah, so and, and also programs are beginning to work with the public health departments to make sure they can reach some of those homebound and hard to reach uh, individuals. Um, there's a poll that's up, we want you to answer that. And I'm gonna ask a question uh, about the variants and also in combination with that, because our time's running close, is will you need to take the vaccine more than uh, uh, yearly? Or is there any discussion of having to take it more than the one time? Well, there's uh, two reasons you may have to take another vaccination eventually. One is that your antibody levels may gradually fall and you need a boost. And that is one possibility. And so far, the antibody levels have been hanging in there pretty well, but uh, they will eventually fall. And we just don't know whether you'll get one or two or three years of protection out of those, those that, that initial shot. The other reason you may need a boost is that the, the variants, as you heard about, uh, when the RNA viruses go into cells, they make copies of themselves and they often make mistakes. And so then they can select variants of those viruses that grow better or transmit better. And, and so the virus, that's the reason it makes so many copies of itself. So it can select better variants. Some of those variants, like especially the one in South Africa that has nine different changes out of the more than 1200 amino acids, um, it is, uh, making our vaccine um, neutralizing activity, what we induce with the vaccine, the antibodies activity is a little lower against that virus. 
we still think it is enough to prevent severe disease, but eventually we're going to have to probably make a vaccine with a different sequence for the spike protein. Uh, until then, uh, I think our job is to get vaccinated and, and, and get the virus loads down as much as possible because if the virus isn't growing in new people, it's not gonna be able to change anymore. So we'll be a, a lot better off if we can get the community virus load down so that it doesn't, so that it can stop changing. And that, that's just not our own community. That's the whole world because whole world. if something happens around the globe, it can be here in 12 hours. So we have to keep that in mind as we're, we're getting this done. Okay, and my last two questions. Um, one is, uh, and this is a difficult one, um, can anyone provide help in convincing people that the COVID vaccine is not a hoax? Any comments on that? And the I, other I, one, is there a database where all the symptoms are located? And yes, that is available, but I'll let my panelists speak to that. Well, Dr. Brown, this is, this is Randall Morgan. I'll just make a, a brief statement. And, and as you know, uh, we have had a series of, of webinars um, that have featured participation among all of the trusted voices uh, in our community um, and those that have been involved in the vaccine uh, manufacturing, the distribution, the testing, uh, the, uh, the reviews uh, of the vaccine. Um, and uh, these are individuals of color. And we feel that that is one of the best ways uh, to try to uh, get rid of the, the, the hoax uh, beliefs that uh, are perpetrated at, at certain times. So I think, as the pastor said, it's, it's word of mouth from trusted voices and just over and over again, but it also helps to have trusted voices that you actually uh, can, can relate to uh, in terms of your of your own uh, life experience, you know, Dr. Yes. Morgan, I'll, I'll share too. Uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and so one of the main things I begin off, uh, I, I begin every presentation with, is an actual photograph that came probably from Dr. Graham's lab uh, from the, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, that shows an electron microscopy photograph of the actual virus attached. And, and, and multiple, I mean, hundreds of, of that, the virions attached onto a cell. And they say, look, this is an actual photograph and we are looking at what is infecting people. And so uh, people have come back and told me before, you know, you know a picture worth a thousand words uh, every time has really uh, uh, opened their imagination and creativity when it came to whether or not I wanna get this vaccine. <laughs> Yes, and also uh, a, a number of people have put in the chat box that they have gotten the vaccine and all of them, it's been Pfizer and Moderna and J&J, &J, and they have talked about the symptoms and the side effects that they've had. That is really a good testimony. So tell people that you didn't pass out and you didn't get all of these things and it seems safe and that you are protected now. And so again, that's, that's really important to do. Um, I am told that I need to um, end this. We're gonna wrap it up and I'm gonna turn this back to Pat as I look at uh, one final statement here, Pat. Let's go to you. Oh, uh, thank could, you okay. all. Thank you so much. I think the, the last thing, Pat, is Dr. Graham wanted to talk about a vaccinated person um, consorting with an unvaccinated person. Just speak with that on a brief uh, statement. Okay, I was trying to answer it in the chat, but it might, oh, be okay. simpler I, if I, it might be simpler if I just say it, because yes. um, if a vaccinated person visits an unvaccinated person, the vaccinated person would be protected, uh, but the unvaccinated person wouldn't. And, even if you're vaccinated, you could still have virus in your nose. And even though it would be a lower level of virus, it wouldn't shed as long, you'd be probably very unlikely to infect anybody else. It would still be possible. So if I was vaccinated and visiting my grandmother, I would 
probably wear a mask or not go until she was vaccinated. And, and so I just think we all have to be careful until the virus in the whole community is down. I, I think we should all have our masks on until you see very, very little virus in the community. It's more about the community than it is about the person. Yes. Okay, back to Pat and Ed. Thank you all so thank much you. for your wonderful questions. And thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Graham, Dr. Sneed, Dr. Randall Morgan. You guys just made it. All the ministers, praise the Lord. You guys are doing wonderful work. God healed, Jesus healed, and we know that you're in the business of Jesus. And thank you all so very much. I know Danita, I just want to make a statement. Danita Brown, who's one of our network coordinators, had a very serious, very serious and long recovery from the vaccine. She wanted to ask the question earlier on and it probably had to do with that issue. I know that Danita had breast cancer. She had her immune system is compromised and I'm just guessing that that could have had something to do with her uh, week long or more reaction from the second dose. And I just wanted to ask Barney or, or Randall, just very quickly, do you think that could have contributed to, to her being so very sick? I haven't heard of people with a long-term reaction to the vaccine afterwards. There is something that does happen. It's called a COVID rash. Or, and, and, uh, and some people, uh, about seven days after the vaccine, you get a little red patch on your arm and it itches a little bit. And it, it isn't very common, but it does happen. It happened to one of our nurses. And that little red patch stays there for about five or six days and then it finally goes away. It doesn't hurt, but it itches and it's uh, a little bit alarming. But I, I haven't heard about many people, maybe Dr. Morgan has heard more about a long-term symptom. Well, no, I've, I've had um, two or three patients actually, in, in a, even in an orthopedic practice, who have come in and had um, muscle aches and pains in places other than where they had the vaccination. And um, after discussing it with them and examining them, it's clear that it's a part of the uh, antibody reaction that's just lasted six to seven days. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I, that's my suspect, uh, yeah. as well as for those people who have had uh, several days of uh, drowsiness and sleepiness. Um, um, so I, I don't think I have anything else to add, except I haven't seen anyone have a carryover longer than seven or eight days. Well, we're yeah. going to have all you, all of you back. You're in, uh, Dr. Randall and Dr. Uh, Karen Winkfield, you guys are on the program. Dr. Graham, please feel free. We're at the dinner hour at 5.30 tomorrow. If you drop in, we'll make you a star for sure. Ministers, please feel back. Dr. Kevin, I know you got your accreditation going on, but we, we welcome you back as well. So we're gonna really have to wrap. We try to keep this to two uh, hour. I think we're going on an hour and a half, but it is yes. so good. <laughs> we could the stop. questions were coming <laughs> in. So I was like, okay, I let's know. get the chance. Okay, well, we got four, what is it? Four $50 gift cards and one box. And Robin, if you could take that last poll for us. Uh, Doris, can you pick out four people? Sure. and? for the gift cards and one person for the big box then okay be wrapping this up with a prayer from uh pastor hey. leslie, leslie. Hey. okay four people um lorraine eddings leslie cooper right. amanda brown right. hold on a second leslie cooper yes amanda brown and um angelo moore Angela. Uh, I'll pass to someone else since I've won in the past. Okay, oh, well, thank you. That's so kind of you. Who was that that said that? Angelo? Angelo. Yes, more. Yes. Oh, God bless yes. you, baby. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. How what? about Rena AG? I don't think Rena, I've seen it. He, to cry him off. He's going to give it to, to uh, Rena AG. Rena AG. AG. I'm this. here. I'm here. Okay. Renee. Good. Renee. Good. Renee. Good. Renee. And the big box. Renee. How about the big box going to Phyllis Anderson? 
Okay, good. Now here you got to do this. I'm going to put Ed's uh, uh, email address in the box and in the chat box. And then I want you guys, I'll send it to you. Um, it, take it down. It's, I'll say it and spell it. PSOC at yahoo.com. That's P-E-A-S-O-C at yahoo.com. Now send him your name, address, and phone uh, name, address, phone number, and zip code so he can get it to you. He can get your gift card and he can get your box to you. Does everybody got that? And I also, don't. Can you repeat also, it? And also, Phyllis Anderson, I need your T-shirt size as well. I'm trying to see where to put it in the in the general. Box. In the chat, you did you put it in the chat? I'm trying to get a general chat here. See the end of Just do it to everyone, yeah. Okay, yeah. Let me see, where do we get this? Uh, okay. And then I think it. Reverend uh, Singleton is gonna take us out, right? Right. Right. <laughs> right. Lord, once again, Lord, we just wanna thank you, Lord, for a great, productive, informative meeting that you allowed us to have. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. As, as we dismiss from our program, Lord, under no circumstance do we dismiss from your holy presence. Continue to lead, guide, and protect us as we travel along life journey. And then, Lord, we pray you do the same thing tomorrow in our meeting, that you would show up and just have your way. Continue to have your way with us and our families. And we give you all praises, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Thank you for this day. Amen. 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 Thank all of you for participating. Come back tomorrow for round two. Uh, <laughs> 4 30 your time, 5 30 East Coast time. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Okay. Yes. Bye bye. Bye bye.